We are back for the first time, for the last time. The last shall be first. Here we come to the final Wikipedia top 100 games of all times for my numbers 1 through 10. These are the greatest games in human history. Or at least according to my fairly myopic biases, prejudices, and foregone conclusions. As well as the limitations of the time I have and the games that my friends will play with me. Oh my gosh. This is a great game. This is, and I talked about it last year, when Terry Pratchett died. This is Discworld colon Ankh Morpork. I think I got a copy of it right there. Discworld Ankh Morpork is a card management, area control, hidden identity game. Where the identity determines what your win conditions are. So one of the win conditions is that you just want the cards to run out. You're just waiting everybody out. One of them is you want to spread trouble across the board as much as possible. One of them is you want to accumulate more, uh, the most wealth. You need to get 50 gold or $50, I guess you call them, and then you win. And then three of the identities are you just need a simple majority, or majority area control. And that sort of provides the benchmark. In, in terms of the, the chaos and the fun of the card play, very much captures the theme of Discworld. It does it better than any other Discworld, there is, Discworld game there is. I've had a lot of luck teaching this to other people. I have a couple friends. They used to play Settlers all the time. Then I introduced them to this game. Now we play. they play this all the time. Discworld Ankh Morpork, my number 10. Okay, number 9. So, I mentioned in a previous video that I thought King of Tokyo was the most influential game of modern era because it did so much to popularize uh, dice rolling games. Uh, the best of those... It's come out. I would go so far as to say that it was a game killer and that now I play this instead of King of Tokyo is Bang the Dice Game. Boom, right there, bang. Not only does it have this fun Wild West cowboy theme, not only does it have the, uh, the, the hidden teams from Bang the Card Game in terms of your, your, uh, your sheriff and deputy, your outlaws, and then your renegade, this is a game that plays better the more people you have who are involved with it. I think this game plays best with eight. Plays okay with six. For some reason, I think the even numbers work better than, than odd numbers. You probably played it before. If not, you need to. If you played Bang the Card Game and you like that and you haven't played Bang the Dice Game, it is absolutely a step up. I love it. My number nine, Bang the Dice Game. Okay, now number eight. This is the best cooperative game ever made. I think that's okay to say that. Okay, yes. This is the best cooperative card game, and that is Dead of Winter. It incorporates so many of the positive things about cooperative games that we love in terms of the team play and the interaction and the resource management and the ticking clock and the shared goals and the individual goals or whatever. But it manages to avoid a couple problems that play co cooperative games, which is having too strong of an AI where it feels, or maybe too weak of an AI, depending on your perspective, where it feels like you're just doing a puzzle together. And it also seems to overwhelm the problem of the alpha gamer. So Tabletop recently did a version of Dead of Winter, and there's this really clever promo where you can see, yeah, you see it there, where Felicia Day is clearly made up to look like one of the characters from the game, to the point that she, she hangs a lantern on the fact that she's wearing a stethoscope. So, of course, she must be a doctor. You've played it. You know it. You love it. This is, this is the future of cooperative games. Magnificent. Dead of Winter. All right, number seven. Travel back with me, if you will, from a cold, bleak zombie hellscape to an ancient civilized time in Japanese history where a group of pilgrims are taking a spiritual journey from Tokyo to Kyoto. Or, if you will, from Kyoto to Tokyo along a trail known as the Takedo. Takedo is a very unusual worker placement game in that you don't place your worker and then get it back, but you place him or her horizontally along a line as you're taking this Takedo trail. And the goal is to have the most rewarding, fulfilling experience. That's it. Uh, and you may do this, codified in points, by, by painting seascapes, or by collecting souvenirs, or by meeting interesting people. Takedo is, is delightful, easy to teach. I will say the basic version is quite unsatisfying. I wouldn't play the basic version unless it were just to teach someone the, uh, uh, the game. 
you need the expansion. Once you have the expansion on there, when you land on the different spots, you have different options available to you, so there can be more strategy involved. Otherwise, it is really a little bit too simple. I love Takedo. This is a game I'm always happy to play. Uh, if if there's anyone out there in board game land who has a spare copy of the Super Ultra Deluxe Takedo that they want to sell me for virtually nothing, that would be okay. I'd accept that. You know, that would be a good early birthday present for 2017. Can't say enough good about it. There's a great implementation on Board Game Arena. Hopefully, you and I can play on there at some point. Takedo. This is a game that I thought about including on my short and sweet list from my 11 to 20s, but I like it so much it just had to be in the top 10. Wouldn't accept any world where this weren't in my top 10, and that is no thanks. This is a delightfully simple game where you get handed a card and you have a choice. Either you take it and take whatever chips are on it, or you put a chip on it and you pass it along. It's a golf game where the objective is to have the lowest score at the end, and so the more cards you take, the more points you have, which is bad, but the more chips that are on them, the more they'll be worth. So, or, or the more of a discount you get, I guess would be a better way to say. You need to have chips, or else you can't pass other cards on, and you have to take whatever gets handed to you. So the strategy is, at what point do I cash in? At what point do I say, well, I'm going to have to get points eventually, I'm going to take this, it's worth it. My goal is to try to hone in on like the early teens, take the 11 to 15 cards, Although I have seen strategies work where you, you take the high 20s and the high 30s and then you're able to get enough of a run of them that they're worth fewer points, but you're cashing in on all the, the coins. Further and complicating everything is that from this deck of cards, nine cards are removed at random. So you don't know which cards are there in order for you to make your runs. I take no thanks with me virtually everywhere when I'm traveling because I know it's easy to teach, it's easy to play. Everybody loves it. It's, it's a very simple game. You shouldn't have any trouble playing with kids, but it's satisfying enough where it's one of those, like you can interest, you can start the evening with this game and it'll be fun and it's not stupid. Like for example, Flux, which is one of my guilty pleasure games. And you can play some more games throughout the night. And at the end, people may say when it's winding down, uh, maybe we could play No Thanks one more time. It's so terrific. It is a game to which I will always say, yes, please. And that is No Thanks. Okay, I'm going to do number five and number four simultaneously here because they're very similar. They're both worker placement games, which is a great genre. I think that's sort of the benchmark style of game is the worker placement in terms of the resource management. And that are, those are Lords of Waterdeep and Stone Age. These are, are very similar in that you're putting your people out, uh, either, either they're cave people who are trying to get you wood, or they're your agents trying to get you rogues and fighters and whatnot in the fabled city of Waterdeep. And you're sending them out on the board to get resources and build up your engine in competition with the people you're playing against who are doing the same thing, trying to get the most points by the end of the game by building up the best either, either fantasy, quasi-legal enterprise or Stone Age civilization. Now, um, gun to my head, if I had to pick one over the other, I would say comparing the base games, Stone Age is better, but including the their unto appertaining expansion, Lords of Waterdeep is better. When you play with those sh that Shackles of Skullport, I don't know how you could ever go back to playing the normal Lords of Waterdeep because it just adds so many strategic elements that are more interesting and fun than, than you find in just the base game. Anyway, there you have it. You go on. Everyone is very familiar with these. Everyone loves them. Stone Age, Lords of Waterdeep. Okay, number three. Now, if I had to say what was my gateway game, right? Like my real gateway. Like I'd played games before I got into it. I played Settlers a long time ago. Played a couple of the games a really long time ago. Uh, but the thing that really got me into playing this hobby persist consistently and persistently, that would be my number three, which is Dominion. Here you have it. I got a couple of the boxes here and a lot more elsewhere. I actually don't keep my cards in here anymore because I found it's a lot harder to play if you have to go through 16 different boxes. I actually got just one of those big boxes for baseball cards or magic cards, and I just lumped everything in there, which is part of the ritual of playing, right, is the selecting which cards are going to be your kingdom cards. Now, uh, the reason that this appealed to me so much is because I played a lot of custom card games when, you know, when I was a, a younger fellow. And if you have, if you know people who play Magic a lot or, or other card games like that and you want to introduce them more into the broader board game community, I would recommend you use Dominion. In terms of innovation, depth of strategy, 
variability, replayability, I think this game is extremely difficult to beat, which is why it is my number three, Dominion. Okay, number two. Now, this some people might classify this as a party game, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree with it if they do. For whatever reason, it is a party game that still appeals to people who don't like party games. You know what I'm talking about, and that is <laughs> Dixit. Yes. Very simple game. You know the drill. You tell a short story put it with a card that corresponds to that. You face, play it face down. Everyone else tries to come up with a card that is similar to that, and then you vote on it. It's... The game where I think with each expansion, the art has actually gotten better. Uh, and I find you really do need to buy every expansion, if this is something you're playing a lot, in order to keep having a variety of cards. The one thing I've encountered is, because the cards keep getting better, is when I bring it to some back to some people, they say, oh, can we just play with the new cards now? And I can understand that. I mean, you may not want to always be playing with that card where it's the the braid with, like, the ring around it, and there's not much of a story to tell there. Or that one where the, uh, the like, ocean lady is kind of laying on their side, and you're like, what am I going to do with that? But instead, you have these new ones that have a lot more characters in them, have a lot more interesting situations, and so there's more to do with it. It's, it's a terrific game. I can't imagine ever retiring this game because it's, it's such a, an explosion of, of creativity and fun you can have with people, either the casual people that you're just meeting for the first time, or family and friends you've known for, for your whole life. Number two, Dixit. And finally, number one. <laughs> okay, here it is. This is what you've all been waiting for. I think there are probably some people who skipped over everything else that I've said and they just skipped to this because they want to see what the number one is because that's the way human mind works. I understand that. I'm like that myself. Though, I would recommend you go back and look at the other 99 games before. Before, However, if I had to choose between this one game, my number one game, and the other 99 games on my list, and every other game in existence combined, I would pick this, my number one game, instead. Now, as, as I've led up to this, I've said things like, you'll notice that I don't have a lot of really heavy games on my top 100. You'll notice that your game like Twilight Imperium, or Twilight, even Twilight Struggle is not there. Because if I have enough time to sit down with with friends of mine to game, I'm going to play this instead of any of those games. Why would I Why would I, I let this game compete with anything like that that's going to be as time-consuming? This is something so involved that I've been playing it my entire life, virtually. That's really my entire, my entire gaming life. This is a game that it is, is eminently interactive, more so than every other game combined. And that game, of course, is... Dungeons and Dragons. What else could it be? I will say, I think a lot of the reasons why we play board games is because we used to play D&D or similar RPGs and we don't have as much time for it now, and so board games are kind of a substitute for it. And when that's the case, that's great, and there are many board games that are wonderful and fantastic that, that I love and that I, I want to play for the rest of my life, but nothing could ever supplant the grandeur that is my number one game. Dungeons and Dragons. Thanks for coming along with us. It's been great. It's been wonderful to get to know all of you out in Dice Tower Nation in this way. Thanks for your support. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it, and I hope you'll enjoy the subsequent Top 100s that we have coming the rest of the year. Take care. Goodbye, farewell, and amen. <laughs>